When I was young, I was a boisterous child. I remember one spring when my grandma came to visit. To help out my mother, she took on the responsibility of putting me to bed. And I hated going to bed. So I'd come up with all sorts of excuses. I did all my homework, or one more game of tag, or I ate all my dinner. Regardless of my excuses, however, my grandma would routinely mention some rules are for everyone. Inevitably, we all must go to sleep. Now, maybe it was her enlightened and percipient aura, or maybe it was just the thick Polish accent, but that saying, that lesson, has always stuck with me. It didn't matter how special I thought I was, the rules still applied. The rules were the rules, and no one was above them. Today, as I look around the entrepreneurial community, the heights of it at least, I'm not entirely convinced that it stuck with everyone. And perhaps that's not surprising. Over a decade ago, Silicon Valley, seeking desperately to be contrarian, started serving out the punchline, move fast and break things. And the entire entrepreneurial community, finding solace in collective edginess, got drunk on the mantra. I mean, the general theme of the last decade or two can be loosely defined as disruption at all costs. Fight the traditional model with a new different model. Push the boundaries. Don't conform. Regulations are malleable. Laws are archaic. Disrupt first, question later, move fast, and break things. Today, I'm going to discuss why that psychology doesn't deserve the halo effect associated with it and suggest a new approach to entrepreneurship for the next generation. I'll outline firstly why the mentality is problematic because it puts entrepreneurs at risk at the benefit of VCs, as well as dangerous as because it plays to our lizard brain, increasing the likelihood of irreparable mistakes. Then I'll suggest a path forward and outline why now is the time to marshal in a new era of entrepreneurship. To begin, the, the mantra is problematic because at its surface, it appears to favor the entrepreneurs. We think of high profile successes such as Facebook, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, that all subscribe to the religion. However, the religion strategically rejects its failures. It rejects them as personal failures and not a flaw in the system. And therein lies the conflict. Successes are considered systematic, but failures are considered idiosyncratic. As a result, a break-the-rules approach to value creation ultimately favors VCs while putting entrepreneurs at risk. Different is disruptive, so if it works, it can lead to really big wins. But think about the imbalanced risk-reward profiles associated with crossing boundaries. If it works, the VC makes 100 times their money. If it doesn't, the most a VC can lose is one times their money. Meanwhile, the most an entrepreneur can lose is years of experience at best, and at worst, their freedom, spending decades in jail. Quotes from famous collapsed leaders come to mind here, referencing the quality of their investors and their support as tacit approval, and in some cases, direct pressure to straddle dishonesty. This makes gray area decisions an issue of moral hazard. VCs are incentivized uh, for entrepreneurs to push the boundaries as far as possible because they don't feel the wrath if the entrepreneur goes too far accidentally or unknowingly. It's the central role of the founder to keep the myth alive, to keep it going, to sell on the price to yearning ratio. But VCs play an almost insidious role in encouraging and fueling the magnification of that ratio, since the VCs need higher and higher paper valuations to raise their next fund. They need a point to results regardless of how they're attained. Thus, they're not only accepting of, but implicit in the fake it till you make it tactics, which can easily topple that price to yearnings ratio and be catastrophic for the entrepreneur. Now let's talk about the entrepreneur. I'm not suggesting that bad leaders are not personally responsible for their actions. I'd like to explore, however, how today's intoxicating thinking can almost predictably lead to dangerous outcomes for founders. With many generations now indoctrinated by the fake it till you make it, Entrepreneurs get rewarded by selling the masses on a vision that's increasingly disconnected from reality. And they get positive reinforcement leaning into more unorthodox growth tactics. 
Societal applause inevitably invites dopamine and testosterone spikes, which heightens a founder's ego. I like this quote from Professor Galloway. If you tell any 30-something-year-old male that they're Jesus Christ, they're inclined to believe you. Reza Satchu from HBS similarly warns of entrepreneurial success, saying the danger of seeing great success at a young age is that you feel that you know much more than you truly do, eliciting the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, recall that the body and the brain function together, and neuroscience tells us that the story follows the state. Looking at the same image, smiling versus frowning, makes you think about it differently. Either it's funny or it's not. So insofar as in you're in a state of gleeful hyperstimulation, it becomes very easy to rationalize all sorts of behavior. And thus the cycle begins. The danger of over-applauding a rule-breaking mentality is simply that incentives work. So insofar as riskier behavior is what elicits laudatory applause, which in turn heightens the founder's ego, which then promulgates more risky behavior, it creates a biochemically enhanced flywheel that can rationalize increasingly immoral, unethical, and illegal actions with rose-colored narratives. Newman acknowledges this, saying that he knows that the chase went to his head. In certain instances, even individuals such as you know, Theranos founders, um, Elizabeth Holmes, are given the benefit of the doubt because individuals recognize that she believed she was doing the right thing. A heightened sense of self and sense of purpose can warp a founder's perception of right and wrong. And it goes deeper than surface level delusion, it's biological. A founder truly perceives their actions to be less bad than they are, feeling increasingly like they can do no wrong. So with everyone, talk shows, hosts, magazines, articles, echoing, go faster, push further, let's stop feigning surprise when a founder steps from I should do things that are different to I am different. From established rules are stupid to established rules don't apply to me. So how do we move forward? Well, given all of this, what I believe inevitably becomes important for today's founder is their ability to stay grounded. And at a time when capital is abundant while good ideas scarce, I'd suggest now is the perfect time to embrace a new model of entrepreneurship. The age of the measured founder. Being thoughtful and responsible rather than disruptive and impulsive is what will make careers for our generation, and it is inherently more founder friendly. Now, being aware of some of the tensions of today's model is the first step, but we also need to be able to take action. We need to train ourselves to encourage reflection, reward others for taking time to think, and normalize taking your foot off the gas in order to go the distance. A few me methods I would suggest. Firstly, is hold yourself to great standards. Use a high yardstick, as Peter used to say. Now, recognizing that you are accountable, you then make decisions that your family would be proud of. Seek to satisfy your soul versus satisfying your Twitter fingers. Next, Think about your support system and your mentors. Make a habit of maintaining relationships with those that you trust and respect, not just during the downswings, but also during the upswings. It may prove to be actually even more powerful. You can't read the label from inside the bottle, so don't make important decisions without speaking to a lot of people. Our competitive advantage as a species is cooperation and communication, so let's use it. Further, don't fall into the trap of marginal thinking. Practice character discipline every day, even in the most minute decisions, understanding that when it comes time to show real strength of character, you'll be better off having gotten some reps in. Lastly, maintaining humility. Recognizing that when a company fails, it's not entirely the entrepreneur's fault is a comforting realization. But I would argue when your company is succeeding, recognizing that it's not entirely as a result of you and that you are not invincible is just as important. In your moments of glory, avoid the allure of oleaginous acclamations, but instead seek honest advice. Ultimately, what most, what most of us want to do within our careers is build trust and connection.
which are built on drops and lost in buckets. As a result, I encourage us all to reframe how we think of entrepreneurial leadership. It's not about making a decision and advocating for that position to others, regardless of how poorly the decision might age. It's about making potentially fewer, but better decisions, being cognizant that the most important issues facing managers need to be grappled with and debated. When we were younger, our grandmas would tell us to follow the rules. No one is there to remind us anymore. It's up to us to develop the habits and the discipline to remind ourselves. It's up to us to embrace a less toxic and more grounded entrepreneurial ecosystem. It's up to us to pave the way for balanced entrepreneurs to thrive in the next generation. So here's to the death of disruption maximalism. Thank you.